doing this since the age of 22. Um, now 28. Um, I'll be 29 in July. So in July, I'll, I'll, I'll be turning 29. Uh, born and raised in Pompano Deerfield Beach. Like, uh, I was raised, like, in Cayu City. Um, you know, I seen some people in the chat put that they were from, um, from went to Blanche Ely. Some people went to Deerfield. So I was born and raised in Pompano, right by AKL. So I'm very familiar with the area. Uh, grew up with, I know a lot of y'all probably know who Kodak Black is, but I grew up with his cousins. So, like, I grew up with Coleon. I know I know y'all know who that is, especially if you're from Deerfield or Pompano. So I grew up with a lot of those individuals. But for me, um, I was blessed and I was fortunate to to always think above my situation, right? And, and I was never one of those individuals or those kids that, that wanted to follow. I always wanted to lead. So from a young age, I always had that discernment and that ability and willpower to think beyond my circumstances or my situation. You know, although there, you know, there was a lot of things going on around me, I never used that as an excuse to succumb to the pressures around me, whether it was like, you know, smoking weed, whatever the case may be, I always thought independently and I always thought like a leader and a boss. You know, I know a lot of people say they want to be a boss, right? But you have to really sit down and evaluate the cost, right? You know, there's a cost to be the boss. So, you know, I understood very early that if I wanted to get out of poverty and take my life to realms that I could have never imagined in my circumstances, I had to surround myself in the right environments around the wrong people and around the right people, right? So transitioning from there, um, I got heavily involved in football. Uh, I was blessed and fortunate to get a scholarship um, to go to Ohio. So let me backtrack a little bit. Um, I started off high school, well, even before high school. I went to Deerfield Beach Middle School, left Deerfield Beach Middle School, went to Deerfield Beach High School. One thing led to another. I transferred my, the end of my sophomore year. I was at Deerfield High, and I transferred to Boca Raton Community High School. Um, I mean, long story short, I was a knucklehead when I was in the 10th grade, made some unwise decisions, ended up getting kicked out for being a knucklehead, right? So they said I couldn't go to any schools in Broward County. So because I couldn't go to any schools in Broward County, um, and at the time I lived in Al Woods Homes in Deerfield, right? Right, right in Al Woods. Some of you may be familiar, right? You probably got a lot of friends that live in Al Woods Homes or somewhere in Sealand, whatever the case may be. So um, I ended up transferring to Boca Raton Community High School, and that saved my life. Uh, I think that had I stayed at Deerfield, who knows what could have happened based on how my mindset kind of was. Not saying I was a bad kid, I just was making some of the wrong decisions. But me going to Boca really changed my perspective. And, I, and, and at that time, that was the first time in my life that I, I ever saw kids driving Mercedes Benzes and Audis to school. When I was at Deerfield, like kids wasn't doing that, especially back then. I know that things have has changed drastically now, right? We're in a new age, you know, with technology and so forth. But back when I was going to school, kids wasn't driving those types of cars. So me going to Boca was, was a culture shock when I would hear kids say, hey, my mom is, you know, the director at the bank around the corner. She works at JP Chase and Morgan or, you know, my dad owns his own construction company. And I think from that point, you know, all the things that I learned growing up in Deerfield and Pompano really started to, you know, start my business, turn, my business wheel started turning. So I had a lot of like business skills from, you know, from the streets, from growing up in that area. You know, you learn how to how to become a boss or or a hustler, so to speak, right? So I started to ask the right questions. I started shadowing people, started shadowing individuals, and that's how like the business mind frame of me started to form and develop. You know, I got mentors, put myself around the right people, and my life kind of kind of like took off from there, right? So from that point, I uh, went to college, went to Ohio. I was in Ohio for about a semester, got homesick, came back home, um, ended up transferring to the University of South Florida in Tampa, where I graduated with my degree in business management. So got my degree in business management, and soon after college, um, I got my first job working at Sherwin-Williams as a manager at a paint store, and then I thought to myself, like, you know, I feel like I'm greater than this, I'm bigger than this. So I went and got my insurance license, right, to sell life insurance. And, you know, started a practice. I made six figures my first year, like, doing door-to-door, -door, like, you know, sales, like, knocking on people's doors, seeing if they wanted life insurance. So my first year, I made 100000 I was 22 years, 22 years old. And then I got relocated 
um, by Fidelity Investments. This was back in 2014. I feel like I'm old. <laughs> but back in 2014, um, I got relocated from um, Tampa. I was living in Tampa at the time. Got relocated to Dallas, Texas to work at their Westlake office, which is pretty much in Dallas. So I got relocated, um, kind of built my career for about a year there. Then I decided to go on my own because I felt like, why make them all this money when I can do it myself? So by the time I was, I would say, um, beginning of 2015 is when I really became independent and started building my practice. And then you look at it five years later, um, you know, I've been 40 under 40, um, published author. I've been on ABC. And I don't say these things brag, right? It's just more so like, you know, for me, like, I'm just very blessed and fortunate that I had the right people in my life, right? And I always tell like, individuals, regardless of where you come from, your circumstances, it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's not about being the smartest, right? It's not about, you know, quote, unquote, coming from the best family, whatever the case may be. It's about, one, having the best strategy plan, and two, surrounding yourself strategically around the right people, right? From all walks of life, that'll be able to help you build whatever it is that you're trying to build, right? So for me, that allowed and helped catapult me to where I am today, and I'm still growing and learning because I haven't arrived, right? Like, I think one can say, like, arrive, right? Like, this it. I know, like, you continue to grow and grow into the man or, or the woman and what you're becoming daily. So that's, like, my story in a nutshell. So what I'll do is I'll pause there, and we can get into, like, more, like, specific details about finances and stuff a little bit later. But I just kind of wanted to, like, share my story and allow, you know, you guys kind of ask me, guys and girls, to ask me questions, and then we can kind of proceed the conversation from there. Okay, so if you guys have any questions so far, go ahead and type them in the chat, and then we will ask Will. Okay, well, they're asking, the first question is from Jill, and it's asking, who was your mentor in high school? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So, um, in high school, my first mentor was this older gentleman named, named Mr. Bill, right? So, like, my mom, you know, I mean, I, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon, right? Great. My mom was working at Winn-Dixie, probably making, like, back then, I don't know, $8 an hour, seven, probably less than that, maybe, like, 7 So, my mom was working at Winn-Dixie um, as, a, as a cashier and a bagger. And, and, and one day, I came to the store, I believe, to get my mom, like, some car keys or something. Maybe I was in, like, the 10th grade. I just transferred to Boca Raton. Um, this individual, you know, he saw something in me, and he looked at me, he said, he said, hey, dude, like, he's like, he's like what, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I talked about being a businessman, how I wanted to do this, to do that. And he said, okay, cool. You know what? Come by my office. Um, and he was actually um, an investment advisor with, um, with Morgan Stanley. Um, had this real nice office in Boca off um off glaze road and i just came to his office and he kind of just sat down with me gave me like you know little items to do little different tasks and, and and at that point i feel like i had someone for the first time in my life at that point that actually like took time to really like cultivate my mind right you know challenge the way that i thought right um ask me certain questions give me different books to read um you know kind of teach me you know the game of life right how life works, how credit works, you know, the things I should be doing financially to prepare myself for college. Like just different little tips that, you know, a really good financial planner would tell his clients. He kind of kind of like me as a kid, he helped cultivate my mind so that when I did get 20, I was already like 10 years ahead of my peers because I had that training at 15, 16. Okay, the next question. Ask what is something you wish you knew about the business world when you first started getting into it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say like the biggest thing, I wish I really understood how LLCs work, right? And I always tell kids and, and grown-ups too, like you're never too young to start a business, right? Or to start an LLC, or you're never too old, either, either, either or, right? Um, knowing what I know now, I would have gotten my first LLC when I was 20, you know, 21. I mean, heck, I wish I could have got one when I was 16, right? Because as you grow, you know, your business profile, your credit profile, you know, you're going to be able to leverage, you know, money, right? 
to help fund your other endeavors and your other projects. So the longer history you have outstanding, just like with your personal credit, right? You know, um, you build your credit profile, you build your credit score by having credit history, right? So every kid on here at some point needs to, you know, figure out a way to, to be an authorized user on either their parents' accounts or somehow, some way, you know, get their credit profile to a place that they can get their own credit card, right? So that by the time you're 26, 25, 24, you know, you're able to make boss moves, right? You can, you know, if you want to go buy a real estate property, right? An investment property, right? These are the things we need to start having conversations about now. You don't want to wait until you're 22, 23, start talking about these things. You need to get your mind prepared for these conversations now. Because if you do this now, when you get that first job out of college, you're going to know what to do with that money, right? So kind of going back to the question, man, like I wish, like, I wish to God I would have started my LLCs earlier, right? Because right now, you know, thank God I got I have 13 LLCs, right? Um, and I was gonna get you know about five of them from this new stimulus package. If you you know, I don't know if you've done much research about that or heard much about it, but I was able to get funds for my business even though they're not in operation. So I'm able to take those funds and to be able to, you know, reinvest those in other parts of different businesses to you know, do whatever it is that I want. But had I started my LLCs a lot earlier, I probably could have had 30 LLCs, maybe 40, right? And, and, and they're very cheap. You can get an LLC down for 200 bucks, right? So instead of taking 200 bucks to buy a pair of drawers or some J's, go start you a business. You feel me? Like, like bro, like, or sis, whatever you want to call yourself, like, you know, take that $200. Don't buy no pair of shoes. Don't buy no purse, don't buy no watch, don't buy no pair of gold, whatever it is that you like to do. Uh, get your head in, whatever. Sacrifice, right? And get you an LLC from LegalZone. That's 200 bucks. I guarantee you that $200 investment is going to provide a way for you to have capital of 10000 200, 200000 in some cases at some point in your life. That $200 seed that you sold is going to turn into much more then what that pair of J's that you bought, or that hair do you could have got, or that haircut, or whatever you want to do with $200, we all spend it differently, right? Like, if you just listen to this little piece of advice right here, it could change your life, right? Okay, the next question was, why did you decide to open your own firm? I mean, to be honest, like, like I, I was never like that type of kid that, deal well, that dealt well with authority, in a sense, like, I always knew like I was made to be my own boss, right? And I know that everyone feels that way, but I knew specifically for me, the biggest thing was I wanted to one, you know, leave a legacy for my family. Um, being the first in my family to graduate high school, let alone college, um, let alone the first in my family to make six figures, it's just was it was important to me to own something and to wear my last name first. And when my kids' kids grew, they can be able to look back you know, and be proud of what their grandfather did, their dad did, whatever, great, great granddad, you know what I mean? So. Okay. And then the last question, when you were faced with those decisions where you could have made questionable decisions, what made you choose the right ones? I'll say this. I, I mean, I'll be honest. In the beginning, <laughs> you know, when I was much younger, I didn't make the right decisions, right? Uh, I made the wrong decisions, but I think, you know, going through my journey, right, you know, making those decisions and being in uncompromising situations, you know, it gave me, and even sometimes when I was down and out because of a dumb decision that I made, you know, I kind of felt like I had time to really sit down and, and evaluate my life because of the consequences of the decision that I made. And once I was able to evaluate and think about the future, right? I was able to look far beyond anything that anyone else was doing, you know, from a peer perspective. So I think that um, just to answer the question in, in greater detail, uh, I'm grateful for those for those mistakes. You know, I think life is all about making mistakes while you're young, right? And learning from those mistakes. However, yet at the same time, you know, you have to understand too that the, that the decision that you make right now in some cases can 
can stunt your growth in the future. Like, for instance, if you go get a record, a jail record, that can severely hurt you, right? You know, if you go steal something from a grocery store, whatever the case may be, that can hurt you great. Um, or if you, you know, decide to get a little boyfriend or decide to get a little girlfriend, right? You know, we're old enough to start having these conversations. And you just say, you, you know, you, you're active doing what y'all do. You know, y'all teenagers, right? And you get pregnant. That could potentially harm you, right? Um, that could potentially put you in a in, in an uncompromised position, even in college. I'm pretty sure you could still go to college, you could still graduate, but it, it'll make it more difficult than it should have. So, you know, my thing is, yeah, it's great to make mistakes, but most more importantly, are you learning from those mistakes? And what you're learning from those mistakes, are you making a better future for tomorrow? Okay, well, so before we get into more questions, um, I know you had some financial advice that you wanted to give students, so you can start with that portion. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, kind of just piggybacking off of what I said in the beginning, um, I would tell any person, like, um, first step, start an LLC. Um, you're not too young to do that. Like, there's no age requirement. You got to be 21, 18. These are one of the only things in life that you don't need, you know, your, your parents' permission to do, right? You just need to save up the money and the capital to be able to make it happen. So, you know, start an LLC, right? Start establishing good, sound business credit. Um, that, And I know that it's probably a term that's going over your head, but, you know, y'all kids, y'all use, you know, y'all use Google. You can easily Google business credit, whatever it is that I'm saying. If you don't understand what it is that I'm saying, Write it down and Google it later, right? Because because when you get in the corporate world and the business world, they're not going to expect you. They're not going to wait for you to pick up the speed, right? They're just going to keep going. And those who can't adapt with, with change in a fast way, you you gonna get left behind, right? So that would be that. That's the first step I'll say. Um, really, just you know, start establish good sound business credit. Um, be a good steward over your money, right? You know, understand that, okay, if I spend a hundred dollars this week on food, what other areas of my life is gonna suffer, right? You know, know the difference between a necessity and a want, right? Like so for example, right, if you had a hundred dollars and that's all you had to your name, right? A necessity with that hundred dollars would be thirty dollars. Well, back when I was going to school, it was thirty dollars for a college application. That's a necessity, right? Because you're sowing it to your future, and it's going to produce some type of return on investment, hopefully, right? Um, going to spend thirty dollars or fifteen dollars on the movies or McDonald's is not a necessity; it's a want, and you don't need to do that. You can go cook, you can go get a pack of hamburger meat that can last you a whole week. So, just that's one of the biggest things I would say is really understanding the difference between a necessity and a want, and really just sit down and evaluate. Okay. What is it that I want out of my life, right? Figure that out. And, then, and this is a great financial tip because nothing else that I'm going to tell you is going to work until you really start to understand what it is that you want out of life, right? Because I believe that once you understand what it is that you want or you think you know what you want, you're able to put a price on every dollar that you spend, right? And then at that point, every dollar that you spend has a purpose. You're no longer, you know, looking at money as an object, right? Looking at money as a means to, you know, to buy your wants, you're looking at money as a needs to fund your future. And I think that once you like reposition your mindset on money to every dollar has a purpose, and every dollar is sowing into my future, I think that you decide to think like a boss and you know and you go from employee to employer, right? Because you're employing, you know, you you're telling your money what to do, and your money, and your money is your employee, right? It's not it's not the opposite, right? So th that's the first best financial tip that I can give you because I can teach you about stock, I can teach you about whatever, but if you're gonna get the returns that you make on that money and go out of dumb stuff, then it, all the teachers that I taught you is in vain, right? So that's a good first step is make sure that every dollar has a purpose. Um, ensuring you know you get some type of business llc right and it's super easy to do 200 bucks go to legal zone super easy 
right? I'm giving y'all a game that I charge people thousands of dollars for, right? And then this is so so simple. Get your LLC, right? I might not give you a whole lot. I'm going to give you three really simple tips that if you implement these things, it can greatly change your financial situation. Make sure, uh, I already gave you the first two. Make sure every dollar has a financial purpose. Two, establish good sound business credit. Start an LLC today if you don't already have one, right? That's two. And I would say the third one is to save about 30% of your money, right? If you can, somewhere between 10 and 30%, right? Try to sit down, get a budget sheet, and ask yourself, what are my needs and what are my wants? And then from there, what you have left over, try to figure out, okay, how can I make every dollar that I have left over have its own purpose towards my future? Um, I really think that if you do those three things, start saving your money, gaining interest on it, start a business LLC, that's a great start towards getting to that next level in life, right? In which, you know, we start talking about things like real estate, right? Buying your first property, right? It's another cool thing that you can do, right? There's so many things that we can do and talk about when it comes to finance, but I think those are three really great starters. Okay, well, speaking of real estate, um, why don't you dive into that a little bit and talk to the students about your plans with real estate um, right now? All right, perfect. Um, so right now, um, let me see the best way to explain it. So one of my one of my great mentors always told me he was like, he, he it's kind of funny yet it's so simple, right? Um, he always said to me, he said. He said, get you some land. And he is real country dude, right? <laughs> he was like, get you some land because God ain't making no more land. So when you sit and you ponder on that, you really start to think about a lot of things, right? Like, hmm, okay, get you some land because God ain't making no more land, right? There's a lot of other things in this world that you can reproduce and remake, right? You know, there's a whole lot of chickens that, you know, you can, that you can, kill to eat, to eat more eggs, or whatever the case may be. There's a whole lot of meat going around, but there's not a whole lot more land. They can't reproduce more land, right? So one of my key financial principles is owning land, right? Because land is one of the only things that's probably more sure than the stock market, right? That's going to appreciate at some point in your life is land. Land is one thing that is very hard for it to depreciate unless it's like some land on bad soil, you know, some land that's been flooded out or some land that's at sea level that can be flooded, that can turn into water at some point. Because we know from science that, you know, most of the earth is covered with, with water, right? But, you know, land is key. So what I'm doing right now is here in Dallas, I own some acreages, acreage of land, some acres, right? So I own about 2.3 acres of land all throughout Dallas, spread it out. So I got some land right now that I'm about to develop a modern, contemporary, like three-story home, right, with the, like a view of like downtown Dallas, with like a skyline view. So, um, just to kind of explain that, kind of tell you about like, you know, how I'm using this project to make, let's just say, I don't know, I can make a pretty good profit on on just this piece of land that I bought for under fifty, right? Bought it for under fifty thousand. I'm going to take this piece of land, this initial money that I invested, and I'm going to leverage someone else's money, right? Because life is all about leverage. It's not what you know, it's who you know, right? You don't have to be the smartest person in the world to borrow money from a bank to build something on, right? To make, you know, and you didn't invest any of your capital, maybe 10% of the, of the land loan, right? So if you bought a, if you're building a $300,000 project, right? They want you to put 10% down. And that's just thirty thousand, right? But what you're gonna do is take that thirty thousand, and then once that property is built, and once you sell that property, you could probably sell it for four fifty, right? So if you do math, four fifty minus three hundred is one hundred and fifty thousand. So it, in a sense, you're you're gonna turn thirty thousand dollars into one hundred and fifty thousand once the land is sold, and all you did was leverage the bank's money to be able to fund your your vision and your ideal. And that kind of goes back to every dollar has a purpose, right? 
you know, and you have to you have to starve your desires and, and fund your future and realize that every dollar has a purpose. You could take five dollars and turn it into a hundred dollars if you if if you strategically think about it, right? So right now, I mean, I got a current project that I'm trying to turn X Y Z money into A B C money, right? So that's 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 my plan. And what I'm doing on this land that I own is okay. How can I turn this land into a profitable venture, right? You know, and, and although I'm young, I'm 28. I'll be 29 soon. You know, my goal is to be a real estate developer. You know, that's my five year goal is to expand throughout Dallas. You know, come back to South Florida, buy up some stuff all throughout Florida, like Georgia, like Tennessee. That's just like my plans and my hopes and my desires for the future. You know, like urban community, you know, revitali revitalization is one of my biggest passions too, is coming back to the neighborhoods in which I come from, right? You know, I call it the hood, whatever you want to call it, and and build something that's meaningful to the people and, and that brings hope, right? So that kids that grew up like me can look at something that they own and have a, a sense of entitlement and ownership. But more importantly, I want to be able to provide those resources and those necessary trainings for those who want it to become educated so that so that they never have to go through life with the excuse of, I didn't have nobody to tell me. Because I see a lot of kids say that, right? They be like, oh, I became a thug or I started selling drugs or the reason why I'm in jail because ain't nobody loved me. The reason why this happened in my life is because nobody told me. Oh, well, okay, we're going to eliminate that. I'm giving, I'm equipping you with all the resources you need to get ahead in life. What you choose to do with that is on you. So when you're at, when you're not where you want to be in life, you got to sit back and ask yourself in the mirror, okay, was this my own doing or was it just because it just wasn't my time? And I believe that everything has to deal with timing too because you can try really hard, but if it's not your time, it's not going to work either, right? So I know I kind of went off on a tangent. So Brianna, keep me back on, on track if I'm <laughs> going yeah. off. Okay, you have a question. What are the top five challenges you face as a business owner and how did you overcome them? To the video. But it's not letting me. Just press the well, camera. Yeah, we can hear you. All right, here you go. Here I go. Can you see me? Did you need me to repeat the question? Um, my top five challenges as a as a business owner, right? Yeah, and how did you overcome them? Um, I would say like I'll, I'll give you guys a perfect and guys and girls a perfect example. I mean, you look at what's going on right now, right? At some point in my business, not today, but let's just say five years ago, it was technology, right? So I go through them like one by one. So tech, you know, tech was a real big issue in my business four and a half, five years ago. And I was one of those early pioneers and adopters that understood the need for fintech, financial technology within my space, right? Every space has its own challenges and, um, and things that you have to overcome because every industry is so different, right? Like I can tell you about my five, you know, issues and how I overcame them. If you go to a hospital, if you go to this industry or that industry, they'll have a totally different answer. But one answer that's constant, you know, no matter what industry you're in, is the need for tech revitalization, right? You know, how do we put better processes and systems in place, you know, to be able to work, even if we're going through a, a catastrophe such as this, you know, with everything that's going on with the coronavirus, you know, a lot of businesses are suffering because, you know, they didn't have the right technology in place, the right processes, the right systems in place, right? So five years ago, I had a, a real big tech issue, right? And a capacity issue. And it, it was weighing a lot on me because I can't be in 15 places at once, right? That's very difficult for me to do, right? I can't, you know, meet a client in Oklahoma and then now another client wants me to meet them in L.A., like that, that started to become a lot on me. So I had to put the right tech pieces in place to be able to be all things to all people and to be able to manage that workload because things were getting real busy for me. So I had to um, implement things like Zoom, right? Like I got on the Zoom um, bandwagon in like 2000 and 
2014, um, maybe maybe 15. I can't remember the exact year and time, but um, Zoom has dr- drastically helped my business, right? And now 99.89% of my meetings are on Zoom. If a client wants me to meet them in person, it's probably like, it, depending on the relationship that I have with them, I'll go grab some coffee or I'll meet them at a steakhouse, whatever the case may be. But all of my meetings are through Zoom. So that helped, you know, re- revitalize my business in one sense. Another thing I had to overcome was this, you know, like, like, like every person, like regardless of which industry you're in, it's education, right? You're not going to know everything, but you need to know enough to be dangerous, right? And that's one of the famous quotes you hear all throughout your professional career is know enough to make the client believe that you're the expert, right? Because you don't have to know everything, but one thing you do know, you better know, is the people to get any question that a client might have answered. So um, that was one of my issues when I first started my career is I didn't have the right team, right? Um, how I solved that, sim- really simple. <laughs> I assembled the right team. I put the right pieces in place to be able to be all things to all clients. So that's another thing I did. Um, something else that I did. Um, another, I don't know if I can give you five. I probably can give you three. So a third business I guess you could say a business challenge that I had was um, from an administrative piece. Um, you know, early in my business, I wasn't able to hire staff. But um, I think that once I, like, understood that every dollar has a purpose and I was able to take a, a pay cut um, from a short-term perspective, you know, I was able, I, I, took a, I took a pay cut for about a year, right, which was okay because – now that, you know, when I started bringing on staff and I had a staff person doing all my paperwork so that I could focus on purely like client relationships, I was able to output four times as much. And in turn, you know, I was able to pay her salary plus increase my salary over two times, right? So just doing like certain little system, you know, and process changes and technology changes can one, lighten your workload because I don't believe in this whole notion of, Working hard, nah. I don't. I, me personally, I don't believe in hard work. I believe in working smart. <laughs> you feel me? Like it's not about how hard you work; it's about how smart you work. And if I can have a computer that can automatically send out emails, I can put the right tech in place to lighten my workload and make an initial investment to where I can only focus on the things that make me money. I'm all about that. And if that means I'm only working ten hours a week as opposed to working fifty or sixty. Me personally, I don't see anything wrong with that, right? So one of my biggest goals was, that's another challenge, was how do I decrease my work life, my workload, and increase my, you know, and kind of like balance out my work-life balance. So once I, you know, implemented the right processes and systems, I was able to work less. So my business is now like on autopilot, you know, and it gives me more time to kind of pick up other like, you know, contracts, you know, work with other firms on the consulting side to expand my business and my operations elsewhere and kind of allow like my business to do what it does. You know, I'm able to pick up hobbies now, right? Which is why like I'm so like, like infatuated with real estate. Had I kept my mindset in the same business mindset, set, I, I would still be working like 70 hour work weeks, 80 hour work weeks for nothing, right? Just to prove a point that I was working hard. That's really all you're doing. So. Okay, well, so for someone that might not understand what a career in financial consulting is or what it looks like, can you just give a, a overview of what your day to day is? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. Um, so from a day to day perspective, I mean, every day is different, right? There's no same day every day but I would say um in a synopsis I help you know one I help good people companies make great financial decisions right or just good decisions in general um I help them to rethink the way in which they repurpose their monies right 
So from a, I deal with retail customers and I deal with institutional customers, right? So when I say retail, that means regular everyday people, right? Um, regular everyday folks like us, right? Uh, when I say institutional, you know, these are words that, you know, as you start to move up, you know, your career, you will start to understand these words. But institutional are like businesses, right? You know, companies that have 10 or more employees, right? Uh, so if I'm working with, a, with, an, with the individual, it'll be, you know, just on a regular retirement plan. How do we get you to retirement, right? What does that look like for you and your specific financial goals? We sit down, we evaluate, and we come up with a plan. But if I'm working on the institutional side, on the consulting side, right, um, I'm sitting down with that business, right, or the you know the executives, and we're mapping out a, a a plan on how do we reshape what we're currently doing from a financial aspect to pave the way towards the future. You know, do we have the right people in place, right? Do we have the right processes in place, right? Do we have the right technology in place, right? And how do we repurpose, you know, our ideology to ensure that we're still in business five years from now, 10 years from now? That's on the consultant side, right? So I'm really good at the finance side, but financial consultant is bringing like the best of both worlds. Like I understand finances thoroughly and like backwards and forwards, but going into consultant, it's a lot different. Consulting is working with people, process and technology. Uh, and I deal, I do that with like financial service companies because I've been in the space so long. I understand like what their pain points are, right? Their woes are. So I'm able to speak to those pain points and help them to identify, you know, how do we get the right people in place, process in place, and what tech best suits our vision from where we're trying to go, if that makes sense. Okay, so we're in the last few minutes of the session. So students, if you have any more questions, go ahead and put those questions in the chat. And you can ask Will any questions about his life. You can ask some questions about his job. Um, if you want some personal advice on how to start your business, this is the time to ask why he's available for the next few minutes. So we're just gonna wait for some questions to come in. Okay, that's cool. I was trying to, yeah, I should've did this on my computer. Did it on my phone. The phone is way different from the computer. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I, was <wondering. laughs> I was I was kept like flicking back and backwards and forwards trying to find myself. <laughs> okay, so uh, Rolanda asked, what did you do with the first piece of land that you bought? Okay, cool. Um, first piece of land I bought, um, well, I'll say this, right? So land in Pompano, Deerfield, just South Florida in general is way more expensive <laughs> than the land in Dallas, right? So for context, it'll be very hard to find something for 50000 in South Florida unless you are probably buying it. Port St. Lucie, you can find it. But I'm just trying to like help you to contextualize what it is that I'm saying, right? So in Dallas, um, the first piece of land that I bought here in Dallas, I simply just bought it to sit on it, right? And so I bought a piece of land, when was it, 2017? Um, it was like, back then I bought it for, it was like $4,000. And that same piece of land right now, it's worth forty-seven thousand. So bought it for like less than five thousand, and now it's worth almost fifty. That's what it appraised for. So I paid like four hundred bucks for an appraisal, and they told me that hey, your land is now valued based on you know recent sales in the area, comps, you know home development. It's now worth forty-seven thousand thousand. So in terms, I flipped. A less than five thousand dollar investment into forty seven thousand in three years, two and a half years. So, yeah, that's what I did. I I bought it, and I, and I and I'm still holding it. I pay the taxes on it, but I can either develop on it or I can sell it. it depends on what I want to do. We got hey, you know uh, so Novins asked, "What is your favorite Disney Disney character and why?" 
That's a tough one. Um, huh, there's so many. Hmm. Disney, there's so many. I mean, you could say Aladdin. It's just like I'm kind of going back to my childhood. I would say I would say this. My favorite Disney movie, hands down, has to be James and the Giant Peach. That's probably old school for a lot of y'all kids, but like, that's my movie. Like, I still have it on VHS, like, and I still got my VHS player. So that's probably like lame and corny, but um, that's hands down. I, James is probably not a typical Disney character, right? He doesn't have his own show. But it's an old Disney Disney movie, right? Um, it wasn't Pixar. It, it was, it's definitely it has to be Disney. Well, I hope it's not Pixar. But I think Pixar is a is a Disney company. It falls under the subsidiary, so either way, it's still Disney. <laughs> but yeah, James and the Giant's Peach. Reason being, why I would say, I don't know. Like, I, I identify with James, right? You know, he grew up in an abusive and a you know, in, in a bad family environment, and he had a dream, right? He had a dream that one day that he will make it to the bright city lights, right? Um, and, and along that way, in that journey, he found friends, right? He found the right mentors and the right people in place. And in tandem with them, you know, they were able to work together collaboratively towards one mission and one goal. So, like, that story really, like, spoke to me because I saw the star of me and I always knew that one day I would make it out of my situation or my neighborhood, right, you know, and, and make it to the Big Peach, right? So, Big Peach would be New York, right? So, the movie was based, basically, this kid wanted to become famous, you know, and be on the bright city lights Broadway in New York. So, like, that movie kind of, like, really identified with me at the time on my quest and my journey of, you know, of being great of, or wanting to do something that's never been done. So. And there was, uh, I think there was another question. What do you do to learn and grow every day? Hmm. Uh, that's a lot of things I do. I say, I think the first thing I do when I wake mm -hmm. up in the morning, um, you know, for me, I get on my knees, I pray. Um, and then after that, you know, I, I listen to podcasts. So I try to like, you know, listen to something, meditate on something. Um, you know, I'll read an article. You know, I get like daily updates from LinkedIn, right? So I'll go to LinkedIn and they'll say like the top five things that are going on in the business world. And I'll look through them. And I said, oh, okay, okay, such and such is falling by 5%. Right, or well, I'll go to investopedia.com, which is a really cool tool to learn more about finances. And it's basically like the Google of the financial world. So you go to Investopedia and you type in any question, right? Anything you want to know about finances, you just type it in, and there's some type of like blog that you can read about it. So those are some of the things I do podcasts, daily um, articles. Um, yeah, those are my go-to. Okay, so if you guys want to keep up with Will, you can follow Will on or connect with Will on LinkedIn. You can also follow him on Instagram, Will Cyrus underscore. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Will Cyrus underscore. And so, Will, we want to thank you for coming um, on Zoom for our virtual career bound. I know, Bobby, you have some things you need to say to wrap up. So thank you, Will. If you guys have any further questions, go ahead and type them in the chat as we wrap up. Okay, so I'm going to send a survey in the chat box about today's session. You guys, please just do it after the session. It's really quick. Um, next Monday, we're gonna have Andrew Koenig, uh, the president of City Furniture, talk to us, and he's gonna be talking about problem solving. So we'll send you the link and all of that in your email. And that's pretty much about it, you guys. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you Monday. And Will, you're getting a lot of thank yous in the, yes. in the chat. I don't know if you can see that. So everyone's saying thank you. All right. All right, well, everyone, have a good weekend. Bye.